Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, Your Honours, this half of our presentation will take apart, deconstruct, expose fundamental assumptions and the inherently unreliable nature of the prosecution evidence put before you. The prosecution repeats time and time again the same sources. It's for this reason that we say it is imperative at this stage that the reality of the evidence is assessed in order to assist you to reach the truth. Simply put, at the outset, there is no evidence of individual criminal responsibility of Mr. Uhuru Kenyatta. We come first of all to the advice that you were given at the outset by the prosecution in respect of your crucial function in assessing this evidence. Mr. Ocampo told you that the credibility to quote of the prosecution witnesses should not be discussed, uh, rather should be an issue that is discussed at trial, and that despite the defence team's invitation to you to embark on what he described as an in-depth scrutiny of the credibility and the reliability of individual pieces of prosecution evidence, that, he tells you in his words, is not possible. Notwithstanding this advice, in case you should ignore it, Miss Adeboyejo reassures you that they have, to quote, complete confidence in the credibility of their witnesses. The defence vehemently disagrees with the advice that you have been given, which we submit is not in line with the rules of procedure and evidence and the Rome Statute. Let us look briefly, given the importance of this issue, at the outset. Madam President, under Article 69.4 of the Rome Statute, which by virtue of Rule 122, subsection 9, applies at the confirmation stage, the statute provides expressly the following, and I quote, The court may rule on the relevance or admissibility of any evidence, taking into account inter alia the probative value of the evidence and any prejudice that such evidence may cause to a fair trial or to a fair evaluation of the testimony of a witness in accordance with the rules of procedure and evidence. As a matter of statutory interpretation, moreover, we submit that it is also clear that had the drafters intended to exempt you from considering issues concerning probative value and credibility at the confirmation hearing, it would have expressly provided thus. Now, probative value cannot be, of course, assessed in a vacuum, but rather is made taking into account the credibility of witnesses. Exempting the issue is inconsistent with your underlying purpose, namely to ensure that no case goes to trial unless there is sufficient evidence to establish substantial grounds. Let me dwell briefly on this touchstone of sufficiency, and may I submit that the pretrial chamber may also be guided by the approach that was taken by the prosecutor before the Special Tribunal of Lebanon, a very different institution, but important nonetheless. In April 2009, it was the prosecutor who requested the judge to release four suspects from detention as he made the determination that the Office of the Prosecution did not have sufficient, credible and admissible evidence to file an indictment. Having rightly assessed his duty as one to establish the truth, 
he stated expressly in his submissions that lack of credibility directly impacts on the sufficiency of the evidence, an approach which we submit must be correct. And, Your Honours, we can provide you with that case law in due course should it be necessary to do so. Credibility is central. We will demonstrate during the course of this half of our presentation that the main witnesses relied on by the prosecution must be set aside at this stage as centrally flawed and thoroughly unreliable. In responding to the prosecution's evidence against Uhuru Kenyatta, I'd like to start with some facts and figures, if I may, to reveal the workings and the methodology of the defence, and to inform your honours uh, the sources and the evidence that we have considered in this case. Having examined the document containing the charges, we began to scrutinise the 6,644 pages of analysis tables of the evidence served by the prosecution intended, as we know, as an evidential aid to the defence and to the chamber. A place where we submit one would expect to find the main evidential components in support of their case. Eager to identify each and every Uhuru Kenyatta specific document, having done so, we say that the results are no less than astonishing. The first point is this. The main plank of the prosecution's case against Uhuru Kenyatta consists of just three witnesses. Prosecution witnesses 11, 12, and 4. Secondly, there is one further witness who I will deal with and address separately. Prosecution witness 9, who we say has no evidence to give in respect of Uhuru Kenyatta. Thirdly, six anonymous witness summaries. Witnesses not named two of whom have never been interviewed by the Office of the Prosecutor. And fourthly, 11 other documents, which I will address you on in due course. Your Honour, as I take you through this evidence, we submit that this is the height of the prosecution's case. These are the documents that merit your scrutiny at this stage. And it is for that reason that my presentation will seek to assist your honours by allowing us to inform you of our concerns. In brief, it is our considered submission that each and every item of the prosecution's evidence falls into one or more of the following categories. Inherently flawed and unreliable and or irrelevant, and or hearsay, and or unattributable to author or source. Our submissions speak to the heart of the matter, which is the sufficiency of the prosecutor's evidence. Our arguments are not capable of being dismissed, shifted or shelved, as they concern the very decision-making process that this chamber must engage in, which after all is a protection mechanism for everyone. A close scrutiny of this evidence will reveal that the case against Uhuru Kenyatta falls squarely within the category of unfounded accusations. In the first part of my presentation I will take you through each of the sources that I have identified at the outset. In the second part, I will address just seven other documents which are contained within the charging document but do not appear in the Uhuru Kenyatta uh, analysis tables put forward by the prosecution. 
in the third part of my presentation, I will dissect and lay bare the specific arguments which have been put forward by the prosecution in the course of its opening and subsequent presentation. Madam President, let us begin, therefore, with witnesses 11 and 12. Prosecution witnesses 11 and 12. These are, without argument, two of the three sources of evidence most relied upon by the prosecution. Coupled together, their evidence forms perhaps bestly described as the widest plank of the prosecution's case against Uhuru Kenyatta. For varying reasons which will become clear, we submit that these witnesses come rather as a pair, but of course must be assessed individually. Both witnesses were interviewed by the Office of the Prosecution some time after February 2011. Both witnesses gave the prosecution what can only be described as a wide-ranging, incriminating account of what they said the role of Uhuru Kenyatta was within the post-election violence and his alleged relationship with the Mungiki. As I indicated, they form the critical mass of evidence. Your Honours, both individuals were members of the Mungiki and both individuals were interviewed first by the defence for Uhuru Kenyatta. Their names having been given to the team by a member of parliament who you will hear give live evidence during the course of this hearing a Mr Lewis Nguyai who has requested to testify publicly. Critically and remarkably, both individuals gave exculpatory accounts of the innocence of Uhuru Kenyatta to the defence and affirmed that he had no role or involvement with the Mungiki. Both individuals were told by the defence in no uncertain terms that they would only be refunded their travel and food expenses on those occasions on which they visited the office to be interviewed by the legal team. All receipts and amounts reimbursed were retained and logged by the defence and have even been submitted as evidence for this confirmation hearing. Madam President, EVD PT D1300568 confidential and EVD PT D1300058 similarly. Following our analysis of the prosecution's last batch of disclosure, which was served on the defence on the 19th of August, we believed that we had identified the names of prosecution witnesses 11 and 12. So concerned were we and surprised about the evidence given to them, uh, given by them rather, to the prosecution after the accounts received by the defence that we requested an independent counsel to assess firstly whether we had made the correct determination and secondly uh, to provide us with information to make us sure that we could then inform the trial chamber. Independent counsel came in the form of Mr Gary Summers, an eminent barrister from England uh, who has his own forensic investigation consultancy in the Isle of Man. Mr Summers travelled to Nairobi last month to conduct his investigation and his file consisting of 210 pages was submitted to the Chamber on the 2nd of September of this year and subsequently disclosed to the parties. Now, in his conclusions, not only did Mr Summers confirm 
that the defence had correctly identified the two protected witnesses. But he also made the following startling conclusions. One, it appeared to be the refusal to pay anything other than expenses that led to the disenchantment of prosecution witnesses 11 and 12 with the Uhuru Kenyatta legal team. Two, that both witnesses were knowing and willing parties to an extortion attempt on Uhuru Kenyatta in 2011. And thirdly, that in his opinion, both had attempted to pervert the course of justice by giving a wholly inculpatory account to the prosecutor after having given a wholly exculpatory account to the defence in February of this year. Mr Summers included in his investigation file a collection of sinister emails which had been sent to several members of the defence team in March of this year by prosecution witness 11 before his defection to the prosecution. These emails included the following threats. 13th of March 2011, I quote, What Uhuru Kenyatta will lose, we hold you responsible. Addressed to an individual assisting the defence. Confidential EVDP T D13 00582 at 0027. On the same day, an email sent to a member of the defence team stating the following. I quote We promised our guys in the ground on what is cooking, and it is risk to promise things to such guys and fail to honour the arrangements, especially noting the fact some leaders after the post-election violence crisis disappeared or were killed. That was betrayal of the highest order. No arrangements, I should clarify, Madam President, with any witness had been made by the defence. Confidential EVDPT D13 at 0033. I dwell just a little longer. In another document signed by prosecution witnesses 11 and 12 in March of this year, they suggest that platoons of men are used to make sure that detractors which in context appears to mean those individuals who have given statements to the prosecution, stop their ongoing propaganda. They refer to the platoons knowing the names and plans of individuals they refer to as, I quote, our rivals, and that they know all those who have already given their statements and the witnesses who have been interviewed, the implication being those individuals interviewed by the prosecution of the ICC. Confidential EVDPT D13 Your Honours, there is no addressee on the document on the face. But we know from the evidence that we diligently collected and from the information before the Chamber in what I refer to as the Gary Summers file that the document was intended to reach Uhuru Kenyatta but was stopped by the legal team. Interestingly, the request in the document to put this criminal plan into action amounted to 2 million three hundred and 40,000 Kenyan shillings, which translates as approximately 18,000 euros, a small fortune we submit. Both witnesses, 
once this document had come into our possession, were pulled back into the office of the defence. They were informed directly and individually by the legal team that their view was that this document amounted to a plan to intimidate witnesses constituting a very serious offence. They were also informed that the defence of Uhuru Kenyatta wanted nothing to do with such criminal activity. Confidential EVDPT D13-00583 and confidential EVDPT D13-00567. In terms of the exculpatory accounts that these witnesses in interview with the defence had given, perhaps the following is worth drawing to your honour's attention. Prosecution witness 12 told the defence that Uhuru Kenyatta was a man who was preaching peace at the time of the post-election violence. That he was, to quote, a very good guy who was helping people, and that he was not a member of the Mungiki, and neither did he work with them. He explained that people, to quote, took money during the post-election violence, and alleged incorrectly that it was from Uhuru Kenyatta. He further explained that Uhuru Kenyatta, to quote, just gave money to local people he did not give money to fund the post-election violence. Your Honours, all these documents are confidential, and I quote for the record, for the purpose of ease of access, EVDPT D13-00559 at 0011, EVDPT D13-00560 at 0018, EVDPT D13-00567 at 0039. And finally, EVDPT D13-00567 at 0040. Prosecution witness 12 told the defence that he had only met Uhuru Kenyatta once in a group with others in 2002. He also stated that he wanted to be re relocated from his home in Kenya. EVDPT D13-00560 at 0015 and D EVDPT D13-00567 at 0043. Confidential. Let's move to prosecution witness 11, if I may, in the exculpatory account he gave to the defence. Just some nuggets, perhaps. He explained that he had never met Uhuru Kenyatta on a one-to-one -one basis, and that Uhuru Kenyatta had never made an approach or a request to him. EVDPT D13-00. 575 at 0002 confidential. Now, the finer details of the extortion attempt, the perversion of the course of justice, and the full run of the emails that were sent to members of the defence team are before the chamber and with the parties and can be located at EVD PTD13 00565. EVDPT D13 00567, EVDPT D13 00573, and EVDPT D13 00582 for ease of access for your honours. Now, importantly perhaps, the Office of the Prosecutor was informed of the conduct of both of these witnesses but has neither sought to withdraw the evidence nor inform the defence of its position in relation to what must only be described as the two most important witnesses in its case.
The defence admits that the evidence collected that is before this bench is no less than devastating to the credibility of these witnesses. And it bears directly upon the sufficiency of the evidence in this case. We submit that the Gary Summers file reduces the probative value of these two witnesses to zero. Crediting this evidence with any probative value at the confirmation stage would not only directly impact upon the fairness of these professionals, but would be also perhaps devastating to the way in which evidence would be allowed to come before this chamber and be relied upon at this stage. This is not all. As a demonstration of the fact that both are professional criminal extortionists, and I say this with a basis, they independently, as it has transpired, tried the same trick on defence witness Lewis Nguyai. Rather than protection here, they should be prosecuted here. May I move on to address you on prosecution witness four. He is the third source of evidence most relied upon by the Office of the Prosecutor. Mr. Kehoe, you may remember, told you that this is the witness whose memory improves with age and time. A classic sign, we say, of an unreliable and untruthful witness. The defence submits that the plethora of direct evidence from not only the Kenyatta team, but also the Masara team, destroys the very fabric of the different accounts he gives. And you will hear more about these sources from Mr. Kay, who will present the defence evidence that we bring to these proceedings. But let's just take for a moment the prosecution's evidence at its height uh, and look at solely that alone, leaving aside the defence evidence for the moment. Your Honours, the first statement that he ever gave on the 7th of January 2008, unassisted, nothing to do with these proceedings, makes no mention whatsoever of Uhuru Kenyatta. EVDPTOTP 00084 confidential. In that account, although witness 4 doesn't put a date to what must be or seem to be the 26th of November State House meeting or what seems to be the 3rd of January meeting, we ask you to look very carefully at the way in which that statement has been written because we submit that the way he writes the statement, importantly in the first person and unprompted, makes it clear that he was never at either meeting. He does not mention in this first account anything, as I stated, about Uhura Kenyatta. However, he does mention an alleged meeting one now, which we're familiar with, the Nairobi Members Club meeting, on a date unspecified at this stage. Crucially again, there is no reference to Uhuru Kenyatta being in attendance. No mention of this well-known public figure in Kenya, whose father Jomo Kenyatta appears on every banknote. Now, in the second statement he gave, EVDPT OTP 00041 Confidential, this was a statement that was for the Wacky Commission in September of 2008. And at 0490 of that document, he claims that on the 25th of November, he met with Uhuru Kenyatta with other Mungiki members 
including a man we ask you to look very carefully at, somebody who I will call the shadow of Witness 4. The shadow of Witness 4 is not an individual that was interviewed by the Office of the Prosecution. One wonders why, but it was not the case. The shadow of Witness 4 was interviewed by the team of Mr. Mathara, and you will know him as B1237 at Confidential EVDPT D12-00054. The allegation in that statement is that these individuals met in the Yaya Centre, Nairobi, in a public downstairs cafe at 8 p.m. We ask the bench to look carefully at the Defence Evidence Confidential EVDPT D13-00538, a statement which confirms that the last cafe to close on that date was 6.48 p.m. In outline, Witness 4 claims that it was at this location, crucial to the prosecution's case, absolutely crucial, that Uhuru Kenyatta informed this cabal that he had helped to set up a meeting for them with the President of Kenya the next day in State House on the 26th of November. Confidential EVDPT OTP 00041 at 0490. Importantly, and we say devastatingly crucial, Witness 4's detailed statement at this stage, running to 13 pages, does not even place Uhuru Kenyatta at the State House on the 26th. It's in this statement as well that Witness 4 changes the venue for the meeting on the 3rd of January from the Nairobi Members Club to the Nairobi Safari Club, two very different geographically located buildings. Crucially again, no mention of Uhuru Kenyatta ever attending such a meeting. EVD PT OTP 00041 at 0493. Confidential. These we submit, Your Honours, are incredible omissions, given the accounts he later provides in respect of these proceedings. The third statement now extends to 64 pages. Confidential EVT PT OTP 00248 in 2010. Here, he decides to change the date of the alleged Yaya meeting from the 25th of November back a bit. He goes back to the 17th of November. And he shifts the precise location. He moves the meeting from the cafe downstairs to the second floor of the Yaya Center. He maintains importantly that his shadow, witness D1237, was present with others, with him, with Uhuru Kenyatta and Uhuru Kenyatta's assistant, who he names. It is only here, for the first time, that he claims that Uhuru Kenyatta was present at the State House on the 26th of November in a meeting in a tent which took place between the witness, other Mungiki members, including the shadow, D1237, Mr. Mathara, the president, and others named in the statement. He gives what can only be described as a protracted account of that meeting. However, you will hear defense evidence in addition to that provided by the Mathara team as to the fact that such a meeting in a tent with a Huru Kenyatta present could not have taken place. Witness 4, interestingly again, changes the location back 
for the meeting of the 3rd of January back to the Nairobi Members Club and for the first time places Uhuru Kenyatta at this meeting with the crucial shadow himself, other Mungiki members, Mr. Mufara, Mr. Saitoti and others. The thrust of this meeting that has been described by the prosecution as crucial is the planning of violence using the Mungiki, so witness four would have you believe. More detail of this meeting is provided in his fourth statement. But we say this, Your Honours, that crucially, in respect of witness four, there's not just one source of evidence which fundamentally undermines the truthfulness, credibility, and importantly, sufficiency of evidence. There are many. But let's just dwell with one of the key sources, perhaps. A man, the shadow, who witness four says was by his side at Yaya, the State House, and the Nairobi Members Club. His evidence, we say, is quite simply devastating. He has never been to the club, he has never met Uhuru Kenyatta, he has never been to Yaya. He did state that he attended a State House meeting on the 26th of November but crucially, not as a member of the Mungiki. And you'll hear more about the reality of that meeting. Absolutely devastating and unsurmountable. I pause there, Your Honour, noting the time. Thank you very much. Yes. You have up until four o'clock. I'm sorry, after. Your Honour. It's my, my mistake. <laughs> the day Obviously ahead of myself. The days for the... L legal team. Defense Let me then continue with prosecution. Oh, please do. We were a little bit astonished. Thank you. Prosecution witness nine. Let's, let's turn to him now, if we may. This is a witness the prosecution seeks to rely on and appears time and time again in the analysis tables, but we submit does not actually speak to the truth of the issues against Uhuru Kenyatta. And it's perhaps important and interesting to just pause for a moment to review the reality of witnesses, Witness 9's evidence. Witness 9 did not himself see anyone providing money or weapons to the Mungiki. Confidential EVDP OTP 00641 at 0216. He explains that his belief that people in the government, who he did not name, were supplying money and guns to the Mungiki came from rumours that were being spread at the time. EVDPT OTP 00641 at 0216. He refused to name anyone in the government who he alleges gave money to individuals to register and fight in the post-election violence. Confidential EVDPT OTP 00641 at 0217. In the two to three months prior to the 2007 elections, the witness says that Mungiki supported Uhuru Kenyatta because he was a Kikuyu. No other reason was given. It wasn't even a matter, he says, of being told. It's rather a matter of common sense. The aim being to have a Kikuyu lead the country. Again, so what? This evidence we submit has absolutely no probative value as far as the criminal charges are concerned before this court. He alleges that meetings were held between politicians and Mungiki for support with the elections for Kibaki and Uhuru Kenyatta. He refers, importantly, to the Africana Hotel, the Serena Hotel, and the Karua Forest. Crucially, however, no dates, no times, no named attendees, no detail whatsoever. EVDPTOTP 00638 at 0150, 0151, and 0152. 
He then clarifies that he didn't go to these meetings which he alleges took place. EVD PTOTP 00638 at 0152. And he would not, therefore, comment on their purpose. When he was probed during the questioning about why Kenyatta was popular in the run-up to the elections, he explained the following. Mr. Kenyatta was a Kikuyu. He was young, and he understood Kikuyu issues such as poverty and land sharing. Nothing sinister there, we submit. Confidential EVD PT OTP 00637 at 0131. In particular, he did not give any evidence whatsoever of any relationship between Uhura Kenyatta and the Mungiki or whether he liaised 